December 7th, 1995, Arrival Day. The next 24 hours would be the most eventful and busiest of the whole mission. The first major event was the flyby of Europa at 32,500 kilometers. Next, Galileo flew by Io at only 890 kilometers above the volcanic moon. Six hours before atmospheric entry, an internal alarm woke up the probe and turned on its instruments to begin warming them up. Three hours before entry, when the probe passed between Jupiter's ring and the upper atmosphere, the probe's energetic particle instrument detected a belt of radiation ten times stronger than Earth's Van Allen belts. The probe sped by Jupiter's cloud tops on its way down into the planet's atmosphere. As the probe entered the atmosphere, it experienced rapid deceleration and intense heating of the gases near the probe. At entry plus 55 seconds, the probe experienced peak aerodynamic stresses and a maximum force of up to 250 g's. At entry plus 172 seconds, the pilot parachute deployed, followed very quickly by the aft heat shield separating and pulling the main parachute out. The main parachute slows the descent module. Then three explosive separation bolts fired and the forward heat shield fell away. At entry plus 3.8 minutes, the orbiter locks on to the probe's signal. At entry plus 6.4 minutes, zero altitude is attained. Zero altitude is defined as the point where the pressure is equal to one bar or Earth's surface pressure. Data collected by the probe caused scientists to revisit many of their beliefs about the formation of Jupiter and the rest of the gas giants in our solar system. The probe's measurements of Jupiter's atmospheric composition, wind velocities, temperatures, cloud characteristics, electrical storms, and elemental and molecular abundances painted a very different picture of Jupiter from what was expected. The most puzzling of the probe's findings was the virtual absence of water and water clouds. Also, the probe's lightning and radio detector found no lightning in the vicinity. The most accepted theory for these findings was that the probe entered into an atypical entry site comparable to the Earth's desert regions. At entry plus 61.4 minutes, the probe's signal was no longer detected. After completing its mission, the probe was slowly destroyed by the increasing heat and pressure, becoming one with the atmosphere of Jupiter. After receiving the data from the atmospheric probe, Galileo had to fire its 400 Newton engine to slow itself down relative to Jupiter and allow the giant planet's gravitational field to capture it. The orbiter's 49-minute burn reduced its velocity by over 600 meters per second until the orbiter was finally captured. Now, in Jupiter orbit, Galileo became the first artificial satellite of the Jovian system. During most of Galileo's elongated, elliptical, seven-month-long initial orbit, the spacecraft slowly transmitted data to Earth that had been received from the atmospheric probe and stored on its tape recorder. On March 14, 1996, Galileo approached Apogeove, or its furthest point from Jupiter, and fired its main engine once again. This changed the craft's trajectory so that its perigeove, or closest point to Jupiter, was raised from four Jupiter radii to 10 Jupiter radii, which would reduce Galileo's radiation exposure near Jupiter. Each orbit of Jupiter usually included a close encounter with one of Jupiter's satellites and a cruise period that typically lasted a couple of months. During each encounter, data was collected at high rates and stored on the tape recorder due to the transmission limitations of the low gain antenna. These cruise periods gave the spacecraft the chance to send data to Earth. 
as well as to take additional fields and particles measurements that were sent to Earth in real time. The first close encounter of its prime mission, G1, was with Ganymede on June 27, 1996, at an altitude of 835 kilometers. This encounter reduced Galileo's orbital period from 210 to 72 days, which allowed more orbits and close encounters each year. A radio science experiment analyze Ganymede's gravitational field and internal structure. Galileo's instruments detected evidence of a self-generated magnetosphere around the moon. On September 6, 1996, encounter G2 passed 260 kilometers near Ganymede's pole. This gravity assist put Galileo into a coplanar orbit with the other Galilean satellites permitting subsequent encounters with them. G1 and G2 radio science and other data revealed that Ganymede has an interior that is probably differentiated into a core and a mantle. On November 4, 1996, Galileo performed its first flyby of Callisto, encounter C3, at 1,136 kilometers. Observations supported the theory that Callisto has a homogeneous internal structure which is 60% rock and 40% ice. Galileo's first close encounter with Europa, E4, occurred on December 19, 1996. The spacecraft flew as close as 692 kilometers above Europa's surface. The return of data from encounter E4 was limited by a solar conjunction that peaked on January 19, 1997. Due to the Sun's interference with Galileo's radio transmissions, there was no close encounter with a Jovian moon during the J5 orbit. Europa encounter E6 took place on February 20, 1997 at an altitude of 586 kilometers. The main scientific objective was to conduct high-resolution coverage of Europa. Monitoring of Io was also conducted during orbit E6. The spacecraft would fly as close as 400,000 kilometers to Io. Radio science occultation measurements provided data on atmospheric profiles of the moons, Jupiter, and also Europa's gravitational field. Ganymede encounter G7 was on April 5, 1997. Galileo passed by the moon at 3,102 kilometers, flying over the high latitudes, taking high resolution observations of high energy impact regions, as well as Jupiter magnetosphere and aurora observations. Ganymede encounter G8 occurred on May 7, 1997. Galileo passed over Ganymede's mid-latitudes at 1,603 kilometers, allowing new terrain to be imaged. Callisto encounter C9 happened on June 25, 1997. Galileo passed over the moon at 418 kilometers. Analysis of fields and particles data suggests that Callisto may have a subsurface salty ocean that is responsible for a variable magnetic field induced by Jupiter's field. Callisto encounter C10 occurred on September 17, 1997 at an altitude of 539 kilometers. Data suggests that the internal structure of the moon is not homogeneous, but partially differentiated, with a higher percentage of rock than ice having settled towards the center of the satellite. Callisto is probably less differentiated than the other Galilean moons. Galileo's last close encounter of its prime mission, E11, took place on November 6, 1997 at an altitude of 2,042 kilometers. 
The primary science objectives of this encounter included remote sensing of Europa's surface and Jovian atmospheric observations. Another objective was to obtain high-resolution images of four small inner Jovian satellites, Phoebe, Metis, Amalthea, and Adrastia. Galileo's prime mission ended on December 7, 1997, two years after Jupiter Arrival Day. The orbiter showed no signs of quitting, so it was given new exploration objectives, defined in part by the findings of the prime mission. This new mission was called the Galileo Europa mission, but its objectives also included Jupiter's other satellites as well as Jovian fields and particles and atmospheric characteristics. This low-cost mission ran for slightly two years with a budget of only $30 million. The first encounter of the Galileo Europa mission, E-12, occurred on December 16, 1997 at an altitude of 196 kilometers above Europa's surface. Instruments took stereo images of the Puel crater region. The stereo imaging discerned the topography of the region. The Connemara ice raft region was also observed. The high resolution images showed crustal ice plates ranging up to 13 kilometers across, which have been broken apart and rafted into new positions resembling pack ice on Earth's polar seas. Galileo's magnetometer provided the strongest evidence of a liquid briny ocean on Europa. Data suggested that Europa's reversing magnetic field is induced by Jupiter's field rather than from the moon itself. This could be explained by the existence of a saltwater ocean just under Europa's surface. The best theory is that tidal flexing generates enough heat to maintain a liquid Europan ocean. Once the existence of a subsurface ocean on Europa was suspected, the question arose, might life exist on Europa? The moon meets the three main factors when searching for extraterrestrial life, water, organic compounds, and adequate heat. This does not prove that life exists there, only that it might. I do wonder what kind of big-toothed creatures are harbored in those dark depths. Encounter E-13 occurred on February 10, 1998 at an altitude of 3,562 kilometers above Europa's surface. No remote sensing or magnetospheric data was collected because of a solar conjunction which reduced the capacity to transmit science data to Earth. Encounter E-14 took place on March 28, 1998 at an altitude of 1,645 kilometers above Europa. Stereo imaging of Manan Crater and the Tyree Makula dark spot was accomplished. Encounter E15 happened on May 31, 1998, at an altitude of 2,515 kilometers over Europa. The spacecraft carried out stereo and color imaging of the Silix Massive, which data revealed to be an impact crater. Galileo also imaged near Terminator maps of unexplored mottled terrain. Encounter E-16 occurred on July 21st, 1998 at an altitude of 1,830 kilometers above Europa. A spacecraft safing event prevented science observations. Debris generated in the slip rings between the spun and the despun section of the orbiter caused the safing event. Encounter E-17 happened on September 26, 1998 at an altitude of 3,582 kilometers in a southern polar pass that allowed observations of many of the targets missed during E-16. Galileo searched for evidence of large-scale shifting of surface features, which would indicate a possible liquid sublayer. The spacecraft image 
the Ejnor Linea, and the Thrace Macula region. Also imaged were the Libya Lenia, a strike slip fault zone, Rhiannon Crater, Thynia Linea, and South Polar Terrain. Radio science analysis of the European gravity field were made over a 20 hour period. Also, ultraviolet observations of Europa outgassing and atmospheric emissions were made. Encounter E18 occurred on November 22, 1998 at an altitude of 2,273 kilometers. A safing event terminated science observations six hours before European closest approach. Encounter E19 took place on February 1, 1999 at an altitude of 1,439 kilometers. Galileo carried out global and regional scale mapping along with the imaging of Tigid Crater, Rod Mantis Linea volcanic features, and mottled terrain. A safing event terminated science observations four hours after the European closest approach. Due to this, observations of Europa, Jupiter, and Io were lost. Encounter C-20 occurred on May 5, 1999, flying above Callisto at an altitude of 1,315 kilometers. Encounter C-20 began Galileo's perijove reduction campaign. This involved incremental changes in the closest approach to Jupiter carried out over four Callisto encounters, C-20 through C-23. The campaign was designed to set up flybys of Io, the Galilean moon closest to Jupiter. Encounter C-21 took place on June 30, 1999, at an altitude of 1,047 kilometers. The near-infrared mapping spectrometer studied the trailing edge of Callisto. Also, dark surface material was imaged, and the PPR studied the equatorial region of Callisto. Encounter C-22 occurred on August 14, 1999 at an altitude of 2,296 kilometers. The spacecraft observed Callisto's ionosphere and measured the distribution of free electrons. Encounter C-23 happened on September 16, 1999 at an altitude of 1,057 kilometers. The spacecraft observed Callisto's ionosphere, measured the distribution of free electrons, and completed the perijove reduction campaign. Galileo's second close encounter with Io, I-24, occurred on October 11, 1999 at an altitude of 611 kilometers. The spacecraft safed at 19 hours before the encounter due to a radiation memory hit. Galileo obtained valuable imaging of Io volcanism and observed a 10 kilometer long eruption of Pele volcano. Io is the most geologically active body in the solar system with more than 100 erupting volcanoes. Observing Io is the next best thing to traveling back in time to Earth's earlier years. Encounter I-25 happened on November 25, 1999 at an altitude of 300 kilometers. The spacecraft safed at four hours before the encounter's closest point of approach due to a software problem. But Galileo managed to collect dramatic pictures of Io volcanic activity and observed a mile-high lava fountain. The Europa encounter on January 3, 2000, E26, marked the beginning of the Galileo Millennium mission. The spacecraft flew as close to Europa as 351 kilometers. Only limited observations were made during E26 due to factors such as the decreasing periods of Galileo's orbits, 
which allowed less time to develop orbital sequences, a smaller workforce and budget than during the Galileo Europa mission, and reduced downlake resources. Encounter I-27 flew by Europa on February 22, 2000 at an altitude of 198 kilometers. Galileo discovered volcanoes that changed from hot to cool since Encounter I-25. The spacecraft safed due to a transient bus reset. Encounter G-28 occurred on May 20, 2000 at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers above Ganymede. Galileo's closest approach coincided with Cassini's closest approach to Jupiter while on its way to Saturn. Joint Galileo-Cassini observations revealed solar wind effects and magnospheric dynamics. Also, high-resolution images of Ganymede were taken. Magnetometer data suggest that a salty water layer exists beneath Ganymede's icy crust. Encounter G29 occurred on December 28, 2000 at an altitude of 2,321 kilometers above Ganymede's surface. Real-time data was transmitted as Galileo flew from the inner magnetosphere through the magnetos pause and bow shock and into the solar wind. Also, remote sensing instruments targeted Jupiter, its rings, and the Galilean satellites. Encounter C-30 occurred on May 25, 2001 at an altitude of 138 kilometers above Callisto's surface. The spacecraft observed the Asgard, Bahalia, and Bran craters in the closest flyby to date. This flyby would set up an IO encounter in August 2001. Camera problems were possibly due to continued radiation exposure that affected distant images taken of IO. The camera problems were corrected before the closest approach to Callisto. A conceptual study, Human Outer Planets Exploration, proposed a surface base on Callisto to produce fuel for further exploration of the outer solar system. Callisto has the advantages of resources, a possible subsurface ocean, low radiation, and a strategic location. Encounter I-31 occurred on August 5, 2001 at an altitude of 200 kilometers. Taking a north polar path above Io because magnetic readings above the pole might help to reveal whether Io generated its own magnetic field. Initial interpretations of I-31 data suggest that either the moon did not have an internally generated field or it was extremely weak. The Tavistar volcano was quiet, but a new eruption from a previously unknown volcano 600 kilometers away was spreading the tallest plume yet observed, 500 kilometers above Io's surface. Fortuitously, Galileo's flight path took it through the outskirts of this plume, and the plasma science instrument detected particles that had erupted from Io's interior only minutes earlier. Galileo detected tiny sulfur dioxide snowflakes of 15 to 20 molecules each. The snowflakes formed as hot gases from the vent rose through Io's frigid, thin atmosphere and condensed. During encounter I-32 on October 15, 2001, Galileo passed closer to Io than ever before, only 181 kilometers above the moon's south pole. The spacecraft made observations of several volcanic areas as well as a new hotspot and plume eruption in the moon's southern region discovered during flyby I-31. Magnetic field measurement findings implied a model in which Io's iron core is heated from the layers around it rather than being heated from its center. Encounter I-33 was the closest and last flyby 
that Galileo performed past any of Jupiter's four major moons. The spacecraft cruised to within 102 kilometers of Io's surface on January 17, 2002. The close encounter gave Galileo the gravity assist necessary for it to end its multi-year mission, putting Galileo on a ballistic trajectory for an impact with Jupiter in September 2003. The spacecraft's propellant nearly exhausted, mission scientists wanted to avoid the small chance that a crash into Europa could contaminate it with Earth microorganisms. Plans for science observations did not go as hoped. 28 minutes before closest approach, the spacecraft placed itself into safe mode. This caused the craft's cameras and instruments to stop taking data and await further instructions from Earth. The safing incident probably resulted from the radiation environment near Jupiter. On November 4, 2002, during encounter A-34, Galileo flew closer than it ever had to Jupiter and Amalthea. Galileo flew as close as 160 kilometers to Amalthea. Data from the encounter helped to determine the mass and density profile of the small moon. Amalthea's low density suggests a highly porous rubble pile or low density rock or a rock ice mixture. Just after the encounter, Galileo's tape recorder failed to play back the data collected. The problem was not a stuck tape as before, but the result of radiation damage to one or more of the instrument's infrared LEDs. To correct the problem, JPL would send commands to initiate electric currents to pass through the LEDs. It was believed that these currents would return some of the LED atoms to their original locations in their crystal lattices. After multiple electric current applications, the tape recorder began running again and downloaded its stored data. Galileo's final orbit, J35, took it on an elongated loop away from Jupiter from which it returned on September 21st, 2003 to plow into Jupiter's thick atmosphere. The spacecraft disintegrated in Jupiter's dense atmosphere at 11.57 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. However, the Deep Space Network did not receive the craft's last signal until 12.43 Pacific Daylight Time due to the time delay for the signal to travel to Earth.